Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Darcy Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is uh, Friday, October 28th, and we will hear the presentation, When It Rains, It Pours, a dialogue on urban flooding across the U.S. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the questions box located in your GoToWebinar tool panel. And for your questions related to the presentation for the panelists, again, just type those in the questions box and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Um, it will help me if you could uh, list who you want to answer the question. Um, that just helps us with the, the flow of the Q&A. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring uh, APA chapters and divisions. Uh, thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible. And today we are happy to have uh, on the line the, what do we call it, the HMDR Hazard Mitigation Disaster Recovery Division. I hope I got that right because I don't have notes on it. Um, but we're we're so glad that you all joined us for this webcast today and brought this group of folks together to uh, to talk about flooding. So today's session uh, has been approved for 1.5 CM credits. Ignore the equity. I forgot to delete that from last week. Um, so you can log today's credits by heading over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or event number both of which can be found on our webcast website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So don't forget to log those credits. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's where I post any uh, important dates or time changes. It's where I post weekly updates on uh, sessions that we have for that week, and also when there are new sessions available for you to register for. So be sure to like us on Facebook uh, if you're on there. And uh, head over to YouTube and type in Planning Webcast and we'll pop up along with our well over 400 recordings. We record all of our recordings, including today's, and we post them up onto our YouTube channel. So be sure to uh, head over there and subscribe to us so that you can get an update of when new sessions are up and loaded and ready for you to view and of course, share with others. So again, uh, as one final reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists, type them in your questions box and please be sure to indicate who you would like to answer that question if possible. That just helps me out. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Avery, who's going to kick things off today, introduce the division and our topic for today, uh, and, and really get us started. So Avery, I just turn those controls over to you. Sorry, Christine, I'm not seeing the pop-up. Um, it, it's probably hidden behind something then. So you might want to minimize whatever you have on your screen and it's probably behind it. Uh, I can't find it, but um, I'll just say a few words. We don't need the slide. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining and, and say a few quick words about the Hazard Mitigation and Disaster Recovery Planning Division, or HMDR. Um, we are a division of APA that aims to foster professional communications and build a stronger knowledge base to help planners make communities safer from hazards and to recover from natural disasters. Uh, the benefits of division membership include access to news resources and learning opportunities through our quarterly newsletter and other communications, the ability to shape division priorities through participation on committees and in our annual business meetings, engagement and mentorship for planning students and young professionals who are interested in hazard mitigation and disaster recovery careers, and expanded connections with colleagues who are working on special division projects, as well as collaborations with other APA divisions. So if you'd like more information or um, to join, please email us at apa.hmdr at gmail.com. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the slide handy for you to 
to write that down, but it's apa.hmdr at gmail.com. Um, and now I'm going to put it in the chat box right now so that everyone will have it. And since I don't I think I have controls, can you hand it over to Damaris to um, kick off the panel presentations? I'm not sure I'm able to hand it over to her yep, directly. I'm already on it. You got it. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me see. I'm getting the screen. Monitor two. Am I sharing my screen now? Can you, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. It worked. <laughs> okay. So good morning, everyone. Well, it's, so uh, it's 10 a.m. here um, in California. Uh, so I should introduce myself first. My name is Damaris Villalobos Galindo, and I am an associate civil engineer at the Santa Clara Valley Water District. Uh, we basically provide wholesale uh, water, uh, among other things, to uh, Santa Clara County, uh, more known, better known as uh, Silicon Valley. So that's where I'm at. Um, and before I begin, I would like to give credit to the Association of State Flat Play Managers, uh, specifically the Social Justice Task Force for their collaboration in helping me put together this presentation. And if anyone from that association is in the audience, um, I would like to just say that the passion that you display in lifting up and amplifying the voices of the most vulnerable encourages me to continue learning about this subject. So as you can see in my presentation, the title is Understanding Flood Risk Vulnerability. So I thought it was a good kind of beginning presentation. I know you're gonna hear other other presentations, because we often talk about vulnerable communities, uh, communities being more vulnerable to flooding. But in reality, uh, you know, I, I want to know what that means. We wanted to know what that means exactly, and if we can measure it, and if so, how can we reduce flood risk vulnerability? So this is the question that my brief presentation will try to answer. Uh, so as I mentioned, I am a civil engineer by training. Uh, but just like planners, I believe that our job is to help communities thrive via the various tools in our professions. In your case, though, you create plans via community input, among other things, that explicitly show the vision of a community for itself. As a result, we all have the role of being responsible vision makers that can help communities become more resilient and prepared for the challenges that the future will bring, as Avery was, was mentioning. So with that said, uh, we know that systemic inequities affect every part of the flood risk management cycle, starting with preparation and mitigation, moving into response, and then finally the recovery effort. On the preparation and mitigation front, uh, studies show that people of color and low-income people particularly are often excluded from the flood mitigation and emergency planning process. On the response effort, we know that low-income people lack, many times, the resources to evacuate during a flood. For example, they may not have a car or they can't afford fuel or a hotel room, particularly with fuel prices, right, fuel prices right now here in, in California specifically. And on the recovery front, studies have shown that after a storm event, uh, neighborhoods of color and low-income neighborhoods are often the last to have their power restored. And we've seen many examples lately of that. So with that in mind, what does it mean to be vulnerable to floods? So when we were putting these uh, segments of this presentation together, we wanted to be more objective about what vulnerability means, and specifically flood vulnerability. So we did a lot of research and looked at peer review papers, and luckily we found a specific definition of flood vulnerability, and it's in your screen right now. It's the extent to which the system is susceptible, and I would like to uh, point out the word system. So system is susceptible to floods due to exposure in conjunction with its incapacity to be resilient or capacity to be resilient, to cope, recover, or adapt. And more interestingly, we found an equation, and uh, you know, many engineers, we like to solve a lot of problems with equations, a very simple equation that relates vulnerability with three other factors or variables. Uh, these are exposure, susceptibility and resilience. So as you can see in this equation, and I'll describe uh, the definition of each of these variables, but as you can see, as exposure and susceptibility increase, uh, vulnerability increases, and when resilience increases, vulnerability decreases. Now, I, as I mentioned in my previous slide, uh, 
I mentioned that uh, we're talking about vulnerable systems. When we talk about vulnerability, specifically flood vulnerability, we talk about, we tend to think about people, vulnerable people. But in reality, we should think about this as, as of a system uh, of vulnerability, which includes three different components, um, natural component, the socioeconomic, and the institutional. And all of these three components can become vulnerable together or individually. So the natural uh, system, what I mean is, um, all the natural systems like riverine, coastal systems where physical and chemical and biological processes take place. Socioeconomic front, of course, includes the human humans and the human factor and their ac associated activities. And then institutional are groups such as the APA or Valley Water, where I work at, or different municipalities and cities. It's where the administrative systems where decision, planning, and management processes happen. So when any of those or all of those uh, faces or factors together are vulnerable, we have uh, vulnerability in general. So just going back to that equation that I mentioned, uh, the first variable was exposure, and I just wanted to quickly talk about that. So exposure is basically the predisposition of a system to be disrupted due to its location. So what I like to think about this, uh, what I like to think it's the where, where do you live? Um, where where is it? Uh, where is your house? Where is this municipality? Uh, how how is its location making it more susceptible or vulnerable? So some of the variables that ex uh, affect exposure include closeness to the inundation area, populations close to the coastline, land use, ground surface elevation, population density, zoning as well. So as you can see in some of these variables, uh, you do have an effect on exposure. Um, and some of the questions that you can ask yourselves is where do you live? Where does this specific community is located? Has everybody had equal opportunities at choosing where to live? Is there a master planning effort being developed for the community? And is it taking into account flood exposure? Now on the susceptibility, which is the second variable in that vulnerability equation, um, susceptibility are the conditions based on a social context that make someone or something more prone to harm. So the question that I like to think about is, is the what, uh, sorry, the who, who or what. Um, so basically some of the variables that affect susceptibility include education, and this is not an all inclusive list. So these are just some of them listed here percent of elderly population, mobility status, communication penetration rate, human health income. So some of the questions that you can ask yourselves is who lives where, what is the income level, education level, and is the community informed about the risk and how is it, how likely is it that institutions, municipalities are investing equally in all neighborhoods. And the final variable is resilience, and resilience uh, is the ability to cope and recover. And some of the variables that affect resilience include uh, having a warning system in the community, having a community emerging action plan, uh, knowing where it is, uh, investment in flood risk mitigation measures, both structural and non-structural, well thought out master plans that account for flood exposure. Some of the questions that you can ask yourselves are, does the community participate in the National Flood Insurance Program? Are there investments in flood risk mitigation measures within the community? Is everybody in the community able to access a flood notification system? Are there clearly established and known evacuation routes? Just to name a few. So just as a summary, uh, vulnerability, uh, it's related to exposure, susceptibility, and resilience. And this is also part of a system and not only specific to people. So before I, I finish this quick presentation, I wanted to talk about how some historical policies and practices have made uh, specific systems and communities more vulnerable. And as I'm talking about these specific examples, think about where in this vulnerability equation um, this might be related to and why might, it might make communities more vulnerable. So as many of you know, as part of your planning training, uh, numerous historical government policies uh, it's known that they have reduced access to housing, employment, fair wages, education, and healthcare for various groups of people. And these created already an uneven playing field to start with. The effects of these external factors are still present today. And one such example is the practice of redlining. 
as well as blackbusting, and they increase the exposure and susceptibility of communities of color to flooding. And in this slide, there are other significant legislations and, and legal decisions. I won't talk about these policies today because of time, but I suggest that if you don't know them, to look them up and uh, and see how they directly resulted in creating some of the vulnerabilities and inequities that we see today and we uh, hear about them today. Another more related to flooding key historical policy was the Flood Control Act of 1936. Among other provisions, this law established the requirement that the benefits of federal control projects must outweigh the costs. This requirement is also part of many other federal grant programs. And even though, you know, it sounds good, the benefits must outweigh the costs, it had unintended consequences. And basically one of, one of these consequences is that this uh, law can result in prioritizing federal funded projects in communities with resources. What I mean by this is that if you live in a neighborhood with low cost housing, it could very well be that the cost of protecting your community will be greater than the assessed value of the homes and therefore the federal government won't fund the project. On the other hand, if you live in a wealthy neighborhood, it is much more likely that the value of the houses, such what happens in California many times, it is much more likely that the value of the houses is greater than the cost of the flood protection, making it more likely that you'll get the federal support. So just as a summary, putting all of this together, so if, if certain groups of people or certain um, systems or groups face pre-existing inequities uh, due to historical policies, if federal resources are not going to where they are most needed, and if professionals such as ourselves are out of touch or do not understand or relate to the unique perspective or, or, uh, of, our, of the constituents or the people we're working for, and if marginalized communities are let out of planning, let out, uh, left out of planning and decision making, it is likely that we are going to continue to uh, contribute uh, unknowingly, unknowingly to this endless cycle of, of flood vulnerability. So if we want communities to be resilient, we have to uh, find those gaps and interrupt this cycle on many levels. Now, I didn't want to end on a negative note, and um, I just wanted to have a quick kind of overview of what are some of the things that, that we can do, and these are pretty generic, and I'm sure some of the presentations that you're going to hear are going to have more specific things that can be done. But uh, some of the things that we can do is establish trust in relationships with historically marginalized communities, remove barriers to participation in preparation, response, and recovery decisions, prioritize and allocate funding to areas that advance social and environmental justice, recruit, hire, and retain a workforce that looks like the communities we serve, and diversify any panels that you organize or special advisory boards you establish and remove obstacles to participation, which many times can happen. And finally, uh, look critically at the various projects proposed, uh, all of the projects you're working on, see how and where they might cause or exacerbate harm and increase, increase uh, one of those uh, variables of vulnerability, flood vulnerability, and when they leave some communities or uh, groups behind. So that is what I have. Um, I have a list of references as well. And at this point, I believe I'm gonna pass it on to Sam. Let me see if I can do this. Um, okay, I'm gonna... Can you guys hear me? Yes, but I haven't gotten the handoff okay. yet. Change presenter. Okay, I'm almost there. Yes, okay, so you should see the prompt. Great. Um, Thank you, Damaris, uh, for a great presentation. Uh, and special thanks to Avery and Christine for organizing this webinar uh, and compiling such a, uh, a great number of experts. Uh, my name is Sam Brody, and I'm a professor and chair at Texas A&M University uh, and serve as the director of the Institute for a Disaster Resilient Texas. Uh, and have been studying flood risk reduction from a planning and development perspective for over 20 years, where the time has gone. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk to you about today. 
the issue of urban flooding from a Texas perspective. And the first thing to note is that this type of flooding that we've been looking at for decades is a combination of acute disastrous events. This is Hurricane Harvey, the largest urban flood event in US history. And in Houston, we're still drawing out for that uh, five years later. To your everyday you know, garden variety, where I live, five, six inches of rain uh, that cumulatively causes a great deal of havoc uh, impact and, and exacerbated inequities over time. Uh, in 2018, uh, with University of Maryland uh, and my amazing colleague, Jerry Galloway, uh, we embarked on a national study of urban flooding uh, in which we defined it here as essentially uh, rainfall that hits impervious surfaces and overwhelms the capacity of drainage systems. In other words, it's flooding and flood impacts that are uh, either exacerbated by or entirely created by the human built, built environment. Uh, and we did a national survey, uh, among other things, over a couple year period. And this was a survey that uh, had representation from every state in the United States. And I've highlighted the only uh, point I really want to make in this slide is that 85% of the respondents uh, reported that they experienced what we called urban flooding outside of the FEMA uh, special flood hazard area, the 100-year floodplain. Um, and 10% or less uh, of those that experienced urban flooding were covered by uh, the Federal National Insurance Program. Uh, telling, uh, which is a trend that we picked up uh, time and time again, uh, this is just a, a slide of all the insured losses uh, over time across the country. So you can see the extent of the accumulation of um, both chronic and, and acute hazards. Uh, but what our survey teed up was the fact that over time, more and more uh, flood impacts are occurring in areas that uh, were not expected before. And I can't tell you how many times a week somebody contacts me and says, hey, I've been living in my house for 30 years. I never flooded, now I'm flooding all the time. Why? Uh, and the triggers of urban flooding for this study, um, along with other triggers, are, are really driven, particularly in low-lying coastal areas, by features of the built environment. And that is upstream expansion of impervious surfaces, uh, development that never took into account natural overland drainage and flow, uh, sprawling development patterns that fragment hydrological systems around watershed levels, uh, big problem of aging and adequate drainage infrastructure, poor maintenance of that infrastructure, and unintended obstacles that become dams during uh, very large rainfall events. And on the left, you can see over time, um, this is just for Texas, uh, and based on the study with the University of Maryland, um, interesting we didn't include Hurricane Harvey here, we can see the trend line of insured claims occurring outside the 100-year floodplain. And of course, that's, um, that's scaled to the number of claims as well, right? So it's, it's representative of, the, of what's taking place. Uh, over time in Texas, again, that accumulation of impact, most of this is urban flooding. You can see uh, Hurricane Harvey impacts literally broke our scale. Um, and a large part of those impacts were from the human built environment because it dumped between 25 and 60 inches of rain in the Houston region. Uh, and that's what I want to focus on now from my Texas perspective. So um, the area, <laughs> for those of you who live in Houston or been there, Houston's a big place. It's really a you know eight plus county metro area um, that's considered um, Houston itself. And it's um, the the problem is multi scale. So I'm starting at a regional level. This is a just a really simple for show uh, land cover image of Houston in 1996, and the gray area is impervious surface. The other colors are different land covers. And if you fast forward 15 years, leading right up to Hurricane Harvey, um, you can see all the, the added uh, green areas are added impervious surface. So it's, that's about 27% increase in impervious surface um, in outlying areas that all drain into Houston. Uh, and 
the reservoirs outside of Houston, uh, which almost were breached and would have flooded the entire city during Hurricane Harvey. Um, there's no amount of retention, detention um, that can accommodate that scale and amount of impervious surface change, um, it, as our studies suggest. And you know that's a big problem. That's a planning problem. But let's go down uh, deeper in scale. So I'm assuming you can see my cursor. If not, in the middle of that uh, that map to the bottom left is a neighborhood um, that. Uh, kind of encompasses a bend in one of the many highways surrounding Houston. And here you see a, a close-up of that neighborhood and um, the green dots are uh, impact, damage impacts from Hurricane Harvey. Um, and, you know, that's a one little corner that's very extensive. Well, if we peer in even closer, you'll see that um, those losses are superimposed on top of the blue and light blue areas, which is the 100-year and 500-year floodplain. And the black box uh, encircles uh, what I've discovered is, from an insured loss perspective, the most insured losses for any neighborhood in the country since 1972. There's about $500 million uh, of claims and payments made. Um, and in addition to that, the Corps just finished off a half a billion dollar project of widening that area of the bayou. So most people, planners I come up with is don't live in the 100-year floodplain. Don't move in the 100-year floodplain. Well, what's not being understood is that uh, in this neighborhood, the floodplain moved into them. So if you look at the floodplain boundaries starting in 1979, the gray area, uh, the same neighborhood superimposed in, the, in, in red now, and you go forward, 82, 85, you notice that the floodplain is expanding over time and that the original in, uh, residents in that neighborhood when it was built in 1970s uh, were not actually in that hazard zone. And so I, I bring this to bear um, that understanding the upstream downstream issues related to uh, the human built environment, stream flow, uh, volume and velocity of water is critical if we're really going to get out of this problem. Uh, so now I'm at the neighborhood level, um, and you can see that watershed now, 1970, the left side, the west side of the watershed uh, was all green. It was open space. In 2010, everything is developed. And in fact, upstream is, in my opinion, <laughs> growing up on the East Coast, the largest cluster of uh, car dealerships I've ever seen along the highway. Um, that's where the problem stems, not in Meyerland per se, and understanding those dynamics is, is so critical at a, at a water, small watershed and neighborhood scale. Uh, but I'm gonna go even further. Um, again, here is the, the area of interest I was showing you. The floodplain's now in yellow. It's an outdated floodplain, it's a little smaller. Um, but you'll see areas that are miles from any floodplain, any model could predict, where there's large clusters of uh, flood impact and damage. And here's one up just above this highway that I've circled in, uh, boxed in red. And if we peer in, this is just a Google Earth image, what do you see? You see a sound wall. Um, and then um, the sound wall, which was intended to provide a buffer of sound from the highway, and there are many in, in metro areas, can act as dams and backing up uh, overland flow during times of heavy rain, which we're experiencing more and more, not just the amount of rain, but the episodes of heavy rain in a short period of time. This is me on the ground right after Hurricane Harvey in 2017. The sound walls to my right, piles of debris to the left, every home flooded, and it was the third time they flooded in three years during that time. So it doesn't take 20, 30 inches of rain to do it. This is the sound wall with the homes to my back. Um, after Hurricane Harvey, they um, made a lot of changes, put a lot of money to, uh, to address this problem. What did they do? They built a bigger wall, like a ginormous wall. That's like, seems like a 15 foot high wall to me. Um, and But they did put um, larger vents, egress points in the wall, uh, and we'll see how that works out. 
Now down to an even smaller scale, this is the structural level. This is another common unseen problem that needs to be addressed as we redevelop areas um, and we produce beneficial economic benefits by doing so, we have to think about runoff and drainage. So this was, um, this house in, on the slide was once a 1950s rancher, like the one to its right, um, was rebuilt as a 4,000 square foot home uh, with roof that is impervious surface, a double wide driveway to accommodate the Texas pickup truck, um, and elevated it enough, just enough to not trigger any regulatory uh, uh, response, but enough that if it, when, when it rains, it's running off into neighbors, it's running off into the street where the drainage is still stuck back in the 1970s and can't accommodate it. Um, here's another picture I took after Hurricane Harvey, where you can see it happening, right? So they, they tore down a home, they're elevating, you know, preparing the home to be built. You can see the older homes next to it, what's gonna happen when they get 20 inches of rain and there are no drains in the street. Speaking of drains, um, now down to the slow, smallest level, almost done, uh, the, the drain itself. Uh, we found in our investigations that, while yes, we need to invest billions of dollars in better infrastructure, we, we can spend very little to make sure the existing infrastructure works. And in Houston and around the country, um, clogged drains, street drains, are a big problem. Um, I point this drain out. I have a large collection of clogged street drains, um, pictures of them. Um, this, I took a colleague to what I thought was the most vulnerable street. Uh, it's in that neighborhood I showed with the expanding floodplain, right up against the bayou, and this was the only drain on the street, and this is what I found. It doesn't take a billion dollars to change behavior, make people aware, keep the drains clean, and that's the difference between water in the home and not. So I'll just end with you know, what to do about it. We came up with, for the governor's commission, a framework for flood mitigation that was used for the state response um, that we've published multiple times and used for the basis of our studies and other local communities I work with. Um, and, and I'll be very broad and, and short here. Uh, the question posed to us is, what do we do? We want to do better. Um, how do we communicate that? Well, there are four things we came up with. Uh, the first is avoid, get out of the way. And that could be freeboard standards, that could be open space protections, buffers, buyouts, moving away from these vulnerable areas. The second is accommodate, let it flood, very far and for some uh, American communities. Uh, that includes retention, detention ponds, understanding where in the landscape we want it to flood, whether that's a wetland or a dune system, et cetera. Third is to resist, we're very good at that, stand and fight, um, levees, seawalls, dams. Um, that is kind of the backbone of flood management in the United States, and that can't go away. We just have to make sure we maintain and monitor um, and update these uh, now aging uh, structures. And finally, and most importantly, I think, um, and most underutilized uh, is communicate, telling the story of risk. Uh, I think, you know, in my investigations, if residents and decision makers alike have, have information that is actionable, interpretable, um, they're going to make the right decisions. And there's so much distortion at all levels of information. Um, and that's the onus is on someone like me, who's a professor, to not show models and, and figures and equations, but communicate this stuff in a way that can foster uh, behavioral change and more resilient communities in the future. So that is my talk. If you want to see one of any of the 18 or 20 funded projects we have at the Resilience Institute, here's the website. And now I'm going to change presenters and hand off my talk to Catherine. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sam, uh, for the presentation. It's a great segue to my presentation. And I just wanted to first thank um, APA, um, HMDR, 
division and the Ohio uh, division for uh, inviting us. Apologies, I'm trying to make sure I can hide myself so I can see what's happening on the presentation. Okay, okay so to begin, um, I'm Catherine Alias, Manager of Community Infrastructure and Resilience at Center for Neighborhood Technology, which is based in Chicago. Um, CNT is a 501c3 whose mission is to deliver innovative analysis and solutions that support community-based organizations and local governments to create neighborhoods that are equitable, sustainable, and resilient. Let me begin with CNT's definition of urban flooding. Urban flooding occurs when rain overwhelms drainage systems and waterways in a built and more densely populated environment and makes its way into the basements, yards, and streets of homes, businesses, and other structures, disrupting lives and economic activity. CNT has done research on urban flooding for several years at this point, focusing specifically on urban flooding because of the realities in Chicago and Illinois more broadly. FEMA's flood insurance rate maps create floodplains based on flooding from rivers and coasts, but based on personal experiences and relationships with others, CNT knew that many homes in the Chicagoland area are impacted by flooding despite being outside of the floodplain. CNT analyzed flooding insurance claim data, 311 data, structured interviews, and community forums to understand the extent of flooding in Cook County. And based on CNT's findings in 2014, the average payout per claim was 4,272. There were health and job impacts, repeated flooding in some homes, and most flooding again occurred outside the floodplain. The state of Illinois followed up shortly using similar methodologies to calculate fundings for the state. And they found that the total number of insurance claims between 2007 to 2014 was 353,603. The total amount of flood damages paid was 2.319 billion. The percent of counties impacted was 99%, and the percent of claims outside of the FEMA floodplain was 92.3%. The reality that flooding occurs outside of FEMA floodplains poses a significant challenge for homeowners and renters who cannot access enough funds for post-flooding recovery. So why does so much flooding happen outside of the floodplain? As other speakers have mentioned, um, it, in reality, it's, it's due to urban planning. The infrastructure wasn't built to manage the amount of water it's required to sustain. In Cook County, there are both combined sewer systems and municipal sewer systems. So we have the combined sewer system on the left where the wastewater sewage combines with stormwater to go into one pipe. And a separated sewage, uh, there's also a separated sewage system where the wastewater sewage goes into one pipe and stormwater goes into another pipe. Combined sewer systems can get more easily overwhelmed because they need to hold both water systems. And if there are backups, it can lead to severe consequences for households. Today, these systems are required to sustain more water because of increased heavy rain events from climate change and increased impermeable surfaces from development and destruction of permeable surfaces, as Sam's presentation showed. Further, the infrastructure hasn't been maintained or updated. Agencies have often delayed maintenance leading to larger issues. And in the Chicagoland area, combined sewer systems are a major factor. As this map shows in the TAN, the combined sewer systems are um, showing the, are shown um, where it is in Cook County. Flooding has very real and serious implications. CNT analyzed insurance claim data from 2007 to 2016 within the city of Chicago and overlaid it with racial demographics. 87% of flood, uh, flood damage insurance claims were paid in communities of color. Just 13 zip codes represent nearly three fourths of flood damage claims paid in Chicago between 2007 and 2016. In these areas, 93% of residents are people of color and 62% of households have incomes less than 50,000. CNT began work around stormwater management in the south suburbs after a flooding disaster in 2013, which severely impacted the county, but especially in this region. CNT began with the community of Midlothian and expanded to include the Rain Ready Calumet communities with a community development block grant, CDBG disaster relief funds, which you can see um, highlighted in the red and orange. We are currently working on an urban flooding baseline tool uh, for the area that's outlined in purple with photo data collection focused in on the orange and yellow com communities. In the next few years, 
CNT will be administering administering the Cook County's ARPA funding dedicated to implementing the Rain Ready plans and running a civic innovation hub, which is a collaborative space created for dialogue, thought partnership, and training on special topics. So about this urban flooding baseline, it will serve as a mapping tool and data source to help residents and leaders visualize three questions about urban flooding. So kind of getting to Sam's point about communication. The urban flooding baseline tool will provide data and accompanying narrative for the communities in that purple outlined area. The data provided will answer these questions. Where it has flooded, which uh, will use information from community identified areas and flood insurance claim data, as well as where there is risk of flooding using the FEMA firm maps. Why it is flooding, so the percent impermeable services and land uses, depression areas, and discussion of combined sewer service areas versus municipal separated sewer systems, and who is holding the burden by sharing five demographic layers to begin to speak to population vulnerabilities, which kind of relates back to what Damaris was sharing. And so additional, some other environmental concerns those populations are facing because they're facing uh, multiple impacts at the same time. The tool is focused in this region due to the intersection of high risk and historic experience with flooding um, with large vulnerable populations, specifically low income black communities that experience disinvestment and lower municipal capacity as a result of systemic racism that has affected economic development. After much discussion, CMT decided that the tool would be an educational piece for residents, community leaders and elected officials so that they can begin to jump into the conversations and data around urban flooding. We did this because often stormwater management professionals already have many tools and quantitative data sets to understand the nuances of flooding, though that data is imperfect. However, those who are directly impacted by flooding residents are often left stranded to deal with flooding individually with little to no opportunity to understand where and why flooding is happening at a municipal or regional level. We hope that this tool can be a starting place. Further, Elected officials can use this tool to be better informed when working with the departments and staffs that handle stormwater management. We plan on using this tool to inform and support the Civic Innovation Hub experience, which will be the cohort experience with residents and municipal staff and officials um, to have these conversations. However, I wanted to note that this tool is not limited to highlighting quantitative data, which is too often what urban planning and decision makers over rely on. Even though the data sources are in, um, even though the data sources are incomplete, obscure nuances and lack granularity. CNT has learned that 311 data is fraught with racial implications because communities that trust the city to do work are more likely to make calls and complaints, whereas communities that don't um, because of a history of racism are less likely to. This can change when trustworthy organizations mobilize residents to use 3-1 systems while advocating to the city to pay attention to marginalized communities. 3-1 systems can provide an important data point for policymakers and agency leaders because it is data coming directly from residents. However, many lower resource municipalities don't have 3-1-1 systems and may not have a systematic way of logging residential complaints. With this in mind, we piloted a way for residents to be paid to take pictures of standing water after storm events. The reasons why we paid for community data collectors were to center the voices of the people directly impacted, so um, because they know the context most intimately, and to remove a barrier for low-income environmental justice communities to participate. The resident data collectors went out and used a web app-based app to take pictures of standing water, log the location, time after storm, and potential impacts of the standing water to residents. This information provides more nuance into where flooding is occurring and how people might be burdened. We hope that residents will be able to use the data during public comment for town meetings and in organizing other residents um, to push their communities to do more or make other changes with stormwater management. So after collecting the data, we thought intentionally about, to have, about how to communicate the data, not only to planners, but also to the community itself. Oftentimes, data is collected and then it seems to vanish or is subtly included into plans. There's a lack of transparency of what the data or feedback said, how it changed the plans, or even how to interpret the data that was found. As planners, we often want to take an objective perspective, but there's relatively little that is completely objective. The purpose for data creation, the methods used to collect and analyze data, 
and the final presentation of data are all decisions made with some type of agenda. So it's important to be transparent about the data and how residents can make use of it. So what does CNT's experience mean for planners? It's a call to action for planners to make sure data and communication around disasters and disaster recovery return power to community members, giving them the information they need to understand climate change, its impacts, and what to do next. If you have any questions and would like to reach out afterward, um, please feel free. I will pass it over to Julia. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Let's see here. Are you guys seeing my slides? Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, so thank you to APA for hosting this webinar on this really important topic and to Avery and uh, Christine for all of your organizing efforts and to all the, the great speakers before me. Um, my name is Julia Rockwell. I manage the Climate Change Adaptation Program at the Philadelphia Water Department. And just to give you some high-level context on who we are as a utility, um, we are what is known as a one water utility, meaning we provide drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater services um, to the city of Philadelphia and also to some surrounding communities. And we have had a climate change adaptation program in place since 2014. And our program is tasked with identifying um, all of the climate related risks that we are facing as a one water utility and coming up with effective and feasible adaptation strategies. So today I'm going to really focus on climate change and how uh, climate change in particular is going to influence uh, precipitation and therefore also urban flooding. So, oops, for some reason my slide is not moving. There we go. Okay, so in terms of fundamentally what we're talking about when it comes to climate change um, and how it will influence precipitation, we're really talking about the fact that a warming planet means a changing water cycle. And there are three main principles that describe how climate change is going to influence the water cycle. The first principle is known as atmospheric holding capacity. And that's just a fancy way of saying that as the atmosphere gets warmer, it's able to hold more moisture. So our team likes to use a sponge as an analogy. And with a warmer atmosphere, we essentially have a bigger sponge that is able to hold more moisture before it releases it, which could actually lead to longer dry periods in between, in between rainfall events. And then when it does rain, uh, the rainfall can be very intense. So that's one big principle. The second is fairly straightforward. It's that warm air um, increases evaporation and transpiration rates. And then the third principle is that temperature changes influence global circulation patterns, both in the atmosphere and the ocean. And these global circulation patterns affect our weather patterns like El Nino and La Nina, um, which water resource managers often study to try and make short-term planning decisions. So as more uncertainty is being introduced into these um, circulation patterns and weather patterns, due to warming atmosphere, it can be harder on the water resources side to do some of our short-term planning. And as many of you or most, if not all of you are familiar with on this call already, uh, we are facing climate change um, as we speak. And I like to show this video from NASA, which is moving through time, late 1800s um, to almost present day. And this is showing temperature anomalies relative to a 1951 to 1980 baseline. So anything that is whitish in color is a normal temperature, quote unquote, that's in line with the baseline. Anything that's blue is below normal temperatures and anything that's red or orange is above normal temperatures. So you can see on this last frame here, um, depicting anomalies from 2017 to 2021, we are seeing much warmer temperatures uh, than our baseline, especially in the Northern hemisphere. Unfortunately, uh, future climate impacts will only increase in severity, and the particular impacts that communities will face um, obviously vary by geographic location. In Philadelphia, we are expecting to see not only increasing air temperatures, but also increasing precipitation, higher sea levels, 
uh, more frequent extreme storm events, and the potential for more frequent and severe drought. And we know this because we look at projections um, that come from global climate models, which I'll talk a bit of, uh, more about in a second. And these projections are published in a variety of different reports, like our National Climate Assessment, which details projections uh, for the Northeast region of the United States and all the other regions in our country. And then we also, as uh, the city's water agency, look to our Office of Sustainability and some of the reports they have generated with localized projections for our city. But this is what we are expecting in the future. And that leads me all to my really main point here, which is adaptation planning is essential to reduce our risks. Um, I'm showing some flooding images here from Tropical Storm Ida in Philadelphia. During the storm, we experienced really extensive riverine flooding. Um, the Schuylkill River that runs through the city overtopped its banks, flooding many areas, including some of our major roadways, which I'm showing a picture of in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. Um, Interstate 676 essentially turned into a canal for us during this event. So, you know, again, this is the point is that we're already seeing really extreme impacts and there is no time to lose when it comes to, to moving forward with our adaptation planning. So now I'm gonna move a bit more into um, precipitation changes specifically and what we can expect as a result of climate change. So when we embarked in our work on our climate change adaptation program, the first thing we did was to analyze output from global climate models, um, otherwise known as GCMs. And global climate models, as the name implies, are simulating climatological processes across the entire globe. Um, and often the output from these models gets downscaled so that it can be applied at a more local level, like a city or regional level. So we downloaded uh, downscaled uh, GCM output from a range of different GCMs and did some basic statistical analyses of the data for precipitation. And I'm showing some of the results on this slide. So I'll pull out um, the first column to just look at projected changes in average annual total precipitation. And we looked at numbers relating to mid-century, so 2050 to 2070, and also end of century conditions, 2080 to 2100, under a high emission scenario. And we found that in Philadelphia, we could potentially expect about a 9.5% increase in our average annual total precipitation by mid-century and close to a 13% increase um, by the end of the century in terms of average annual total rainfall. And so understanding these changes in average conditions is helpful, but it doesn't really tell us too much about how the most extreme events will change. And those extreme events, as we all know, are what lead to some of the most extreme and devastating urban flooding impacts. So it's actually a known limitation of the global climate models that they don't accurately um, simulate extreme events. And I almost don't like using the word limitation because these, these models, again, are really operating at a global scale. And the events we are looking to them to simulate are often these hyper-localized convective storm systems um, that are just at a much, much smaller scale. So researchers are pursuing other approaches aside from the GCMs to understand how these extreme storms could intensify in the future. They're looking at things like convective permitting models, uh, which are really weather models um, that are usually used for short range forecasts and are now being applied to climate change studies. And they're also doing different statistical modeling techniques. Uh, the thing with these approaches is, approaches is that they can often be very data intensive, costly, and require significant climate modeling expertise. So our team has been exploring, are there other options to help us understand how extreme these events could get? And before I go to the next slide, I just want to point out that one of the main tools we use as water utility practitioners to characterize precipitation events are these intensity duration frequency or IDF curves. I'm not expecting you to like read what's on this graphic here because I know it's quite small, but it's those three parameters that we're trying to understand how they will change. The intensity in inches per hour, um, the duration, and then the frequency is often referred to as the return interval. Um, so when you hear the term, you know, that event was a 100 year storm event, that is a return interval 
and is estimating the probability of that event occurring. And a 100-year event has about a 1% probability of occurring in any given year. So our team has been looking into this about how we can supplement the GCM output with additional information. And we've really honed in on these temperature-based methodologies, which rely on a fundamental principle I mentioned earlier, the principle of atmospheric holding capacity, and the reason why I have these sponges up on this slide. So again, as the atmosphere is warming, it's able to hold more moisture. And there is a physical relationship called the clausius clapeyron principle that says for about every one degree Celsius of warming, we could see about a 7% increase in rainfall. So that principle is a guiding a lot of recent research on what we could expect in terms of increasing precipitation. And the great thing about these temperature-based methodologies is that they're relying on air temperature projections from the GCMs. And the global climate models are very accurate in terms of simulating air temperature. So this is something, again, we're looking into. I have a graphic here from Climate Central, which is a really great organization, um, does a lot of research and a lot of great data visualization on climate impacts. And this is showing the same principle, just you know, in degrees Fahrenheit. Recent research in this realm has also indicated, though, that there is uh, the potential for intensification to go even beyond this 7%. Um, so for every degree Celsius of warming, there is the potential that there could be a higher than 7% increase. And this has been termed the super Clausius clapeyron So pretty concerning. Um, and, you know, I, I think at, at PWD, we're really trying to wrap our heads around some of the new research and determine how we want to inform um, the data we're using with this information. But I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the numbers we're seeing in the literature. So across methodologies, beyond just the temperature-based methodology and considering some of the, the other uh, modeling approaches that are being used, research suggests that precipitation intensities will be the greatest for short duration events that have high return intervals or are less frequent, in other words. And we're really talking about potentially very large increases in storm event volumes. Um, for example, for end of century conditions under a high emission scenario in the Northeast region of the US, we could see about a 22% increase in event volume for a 24 hour, 10 year storm event. And then if we look at a less frequent event, a 24 hour, 100 year storm event, we could see around a 30% increase in event volume. And then moving to a shorter duration, which the literature tells us should go up even more in terms of intensity, for a two hour, 100 year event, we could see close to a 70% increase in event volume. And again, this is assuming a high emission scenario. So this really speaks to the importance of mitigation activities to, to make sure we don't see the worst potential scenarios play out in the future. But these are really, really large changes that we could potentially uh, experience in the future and need to be prepared for. So the question then, of course, is how do we plan for a future that could include these really intense precipitation changes? How do we adapt? At PWD, um, one of our main adaptation strategies right now is to mainstream the use of climate projections in all of our um, infrastructure planning and design decisions. And our main mechanism for doing that is through a document called our Climate Resilient Planning and Design Guidance, the cover for which I'm showing here. And we have a whole a section in this guidance that's focused on precipitation projections, our storm ahead section. Um, and right now we're just trying to figure out um, how and if we should update what's in this guidance with some of the, the latest research that I just presented. We are also carrying out risk assessments to identify what specific adaptation strategies the department should invest in uh, moving forward. And we're also exploring changes to our policies and standards so thinking beyond um, more traditional infrastructure or physical asset-based solutions and thinking about what policies we could actually institute or existing policies we could modify to help reduce our risks. And I'm going to leave you all with this slide in terms of what does effective adaptation look like to you all when it comes to urban flooding and what we're already experiencing today and what we could experience in the future. Um, I think, you know, increasing precipitation is obviously a driver of more extreme urban flooding, but there are a lot of other factors to consider. And I think 
Sam referred to them as triggers. I thought that was a good way of putting it. And in essence, climate change is going to exacerbate a lot of or all of the existing triggers for urban flooding. So I have just a few listed here. Land use and development practices, obviously really critical in all this. Land cover policies, including flood risk management policies, drainage system capacity, acknowledging that we can't necessarily upsize our pipes so much that we'll be able to deal with you know, extreme events. But what can we do to, to you know, increase capacity? Maybe it's something as simple as cleaning our drains, <laughs> which is a really great example of low hanging fruit in terms of, of adaptation. And then thinking about the equity lens in all of this and how are we going to make sure that whatever adaptation strategies we pursue for urban flooding are equitable, address inequities. And then lastly, I'll just say that, you know, we're talking about urban flooding today, which is a very specific type of flooding. There are communities around the country, including Philadelphia, that are vulnerable to multiple types of flooding, like coastal flooding and or riverine flooding. And these impacts from these different types of flood events can happen simultaneously during um, storm events. So we need to kind of think holistically about these flooding risks. Um, and then others, question mark, I'd love to hear from, from you all during our Q&A about other things you consider in your work when it comes to addressing um, urban flooding. So I will leave it at that. Feel free to reach out with any questions. My contact info is here and I'm going to attempt to stop sharing. Great. Thank you. If everyone wants to go ahead and throw their webcams back on, we can jump into some Q&A. Um, again, if you have questions for our panelists, just go ahead and type those into the questions box in your GoToWebinar tool panel. Um, so our, our first question, we're going to jump right into um, Damaris. Um, for cost effectiveness for acquisitions for more expensive housing, um, wouldn't the cost of acquiring those properties also be greater? So the cost benefit or the, the, the cost benefit ratio could actually be similar to lower valued housing that has lower costs to move in um, than lower uh, benefits for mitigating structural damage. Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, um, basically mm -hmm. it asked about the cost of acquiring a property. Um, yes. And then in a low income. For more expensive housing. For more expensive housing, the, the cost of, mm -hmm. yes, it is it is more expensive. Uh, however, I, f I see that <laughs> from grabbing from, from examples in my, my specific career uh, working on flood risk uh, reduction projects, because at least the area I was working on, a lot of these more expensive houses were located next to creeks. Uh, people like to be able to see the creek and you know that's why they purchase the property. It gets flooded and then they usually um, fix the property, right? They have the means to fix it, they have insurance. And then the next flood event happens again. And then again, there is another, you know, there is damage. So I feel that compounded the cost might, of damages might be more than just acquiring the property eventually. So yeah, ba based on an example from my own experience. So basically you just acquire the property. If it's next to a creek and you wanna create this buffer, right, more open space, a lot of people talked about that and, and, and basically have this river in natural river in space, it might be uh, better than just continue to uh, rebuild and reconstruct um, the house. Right. Yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so this one uh, is gonna be for, for anyone. Uh, given existing constraints, legal, regulatory, funding, uh, what do you view as some practical steps or changes that planners can make in their day-to-day -day work to address urban flood risk? Who would like to push on, on that? <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, given existing constraints like legal regulatory funding, uh, what do you view as some practical steps or changes the planners can make in their day-to-day -day work to address urban flooding risk. I was just going to briefly maybe start off by saying um, 
at the Philadelphia Water Department, I think we're thinking, trying to think more holistically about the programs and projects that we're pursuing that could potentially reduce urban flooding risks, but maybe as they currently stand, that you know, urban flooding isn't a primary driver. Um, an example is our green infrastructure program, which is our green cities, clean waters program. And the primary driver for that program is to reduce our combined sewer overflows. So we have design standards that are all aimed at that driver um, that are looking at capturing the first inch and a half or two inches of rainfall. And we're starting to have uh, many conversations with our GSI planners and designers about how maybe we could expand the drivers for that program and include things like climate resilience. You know, what would these green systems look like if we started to think about mitigating flood risks, localized flooding risks? Um, and so I think just thinking holistically about, you know, whatever you're working on, are there ways in which you can, you know, bring in other drivers, um, resilience-based drivers specifically, I guess, in this context, um, and build that into the into the work you do. So we're kind of, you know, tackling multiple things with one set of investments. One uh, something I would add is also like yes, we're planners, but planners work within this system of other humans have other roles, right? And so the regulatory and other like constraints are there because other humans have built those. So who can you organize with? Who what who who can you communicate with with the data that we have the technical expertise we have to help support the organizing that is required to make those changes right so like there will be some smaller or sooner things that we can do within our role and definition as a planner but we need to expand our understanding of what being a planner is and that means helping to organize with communities providing the technical expertise that we have communicating that in a way that people who don't have all the degrees that we have be able to use that so they can push their lawmakers their um all the other like actors to make those other regulatory longer term changes in addition to the other planning things that we can do. I was gonna say, uh, you know, um, you know, agree with what Julia was saying, uh, and also, you know, think holistically. I, you know, in my experience, sometimes different agencies as you're working together, they all have their own priorities, right? But in reality, uh, for example, if you're planning. Uh, big development project and uh, and there is a big push right from developers to build to be, have it to be very dense and then you have the engineers or the drainage engineers talking about hey you know we have to leave room for this and that but no you know there's a push to build more and more so there is a reason why right uh, I, I feel that the intention is not always just to make things harder so just to be able to be a little bit more flexible and be able to work with others and i totally understand right there is this push from you know regulatory and your same agency but at the end of the day i think several of us mentioned that our jobs are to make our communities more resilient especially you know based on on what julia was talking about climate change things come back and bite us in the back <laughs> i i there is an example of this uh, development that happened uh, I heard about I wasn't present but it was a big push to build it and then there was a big flooding event a few, couple years after and the whole development flooded and that had been mentioned before that, that it could flood right and, and uh, so yeah it's gonna come back I feel so just be it's take a pause understand and look at, at it holistically but um yeah just wanted to say that. I would just add look upstream look regionally analyze unintended consequences of the built environment otherwise you're going to come up with the wrong answer um and i, I guess i'm what i'm getting i guess from all of you and it makes sense and i guess i didn't think about this right away um is that is that looking around you looking upstream downstream side stream whatever it is um and that there are probably a lot of other issues going on in your community where um having this having discussion um about flood risk is important you know when you're talking um about public health issues in your community uh when you're talking about affordable housing when we're talking about equity and environmental justice um i feel like this is something that is very integral to all of those other topics um so getting a handle on what else is going on in your community and where this 
particular discussion can fit in other discussions um, is a is a good way to to broach the subject to um, you know to the community when you have so many regulatory or funding issues already is being creative uh, and, and figuring out ways that you can put it in and, and slice and dice a little bit. So this is very interesting what I'm hearing. Um, okay, uh, moving on, uh, I got a couple questions for you, Sam. The first one is, um, is the expansion of the floodplain due to increased impervious coverage um, slash development in the area? Um, can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, so um, to my the example I showed, um, oftentimes, you know, I, I try to impress that these boundaries, A, are arbitrary in a lot of ways, and B, they're dynamic. So if you're, you know, if you're a couple hundred feet from a floodplain, FEMA will treat you as if you're a thousand miles, sorry, a thousand miles out of the floodplain. Um, but these things move and they particularly are sensitive to impervious surface upstream, creating more volume and velocity of flow downstream that then expands out. And so our answer in this example and around the country um, is let's treat the symptom. So the downstall, the effort is downstream to widen the bayou, or the river, and no one's looking up at the, in my example, hundreds of acres of car dealership parking lots and what the implications are. And if they had done that originally in a planning format, maybe they would have done things differently. And, you know, it's cost the taxpayer in that little corner half a billion dollars. That's just one corner in America. But, it, you know, floodplains can change, risk can change for other factors as well. I'm focused on like heavier rainfall, you know, over time, uh, but I'm always focusing on the built environment um, and impervious surface accelerates runoff, uh, increases the peak discharge and essentially forces water downstream. And America, I was sent here, is, you know, the stormwater management systems in most of America are based on a uh, concept called conveyance and that's get the water out as quickly and efficiently as possible which is why we concrete line our channels and see in LA in the movies and all over Houston and that worked in the 1900s because the next place downstream was the ocean or an uninhabited area we're clinging on to this conveyance mentality but the next place downstream is someone else's living room and and it's really going to require kind of and we're, and we're getting there at hockley a shift in thinking and practice away from conveyance and maybe more living with water like the dutch do or a synergistic strategy of retention accommodation avoidance and resistance thank you um, another question for you, what is the date of the most recent flood insurance rate map for the Houston neighborhood? The date? That's what the question is. They just came out with new rates. Okay. I'm way in the X zone. My rates doubled. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I think that person may, there's a big article that came out a couple days ago in Houston that one in 12 people have dropped their flood insurance since the new rates came out or something like that. Um, there's a huge drop in rates, in, in take up of insurance in response to those rising rates. And that's also a huge problem, more from a recovery standpoint in my mind than a prevention standpoint. Oh, the map. He says not the rates, the ma not the rates, the map. That's oh, the map. Asking. So. The maps are still 2018, I think, but they're coming out with new ones and they're gonna try to roll back the freeboard standard once those come out. Okay, all right. Um, next question, uh, let's, let's move over to you, Catherine. 
um, the work that um, that you were talking about in your presentation, was it done at the county or the city level? The second half of my presentation, yeah. like after the maps, that was done. Right. Uh, we were looking at a specific region within the county okay. and then looking at uh, like like more granular data from there. So looking at this municipal, like building up from like block groups, et cetera, to the municipal level. Got it, okay. Um, what app was used and was there a pay scale based off of the information collected and provided? Yeah, so the app, uh, CNT built the app. So it's a, uh, okay. it's a web-based app that CNT had coded yeah. and created. And then in terms of payment, since this was our pilot, what we did was um, we paid for training, we paid, um, and then we paid based on the number of deployments they went uh, went out for those storms as opposed to the information because they are still spending their time to go out and take those pictures and walk, um, you know, go get that data. Okay, Good. thank you. Um, Julia, could you, these are great questions today. Could you describe how the city determines what level of risk is acceptable for example you mentioned a range of possibilities for different storms what criteria are used to develop the standards the design standards that's a great question and um yeah. i would say we're actually still working through that in our guidance document not all of the information we present is very prescriptive in terms of defining a specific level of service um, and it is that case right now with all the precipitation related numbers. We're still working internally with different teams, including our flood risk management team, our team that does standard sewer um, replacement work to, to see what would make sense in terms of the work they do and what they see um, in terms of bumping up these numbers. So. It's it's a really tricky question though because you know in in different parts of the city city you have different levels of service that can be achieved uh, especially considering these really extreme precipitation projections um, and it's not like we can completely engineer ourselves out of all risk related to these extreme storms right so the conversation really has to be about what level of residual risk are we going to be comfortable with in terms of determining a level of service? Um, and I, I think you know we have a lot more conversations we need to have uh, in terms of that as a city and internally. Um, but generally, I can say there are a few principles we look at when we're dealing with specific projects to try and understand what level of risk we want to design those projects for. Um, the sensitivity of the project is one. How sensitive is it to flooding? How exposed is it now or could it be, you know, in the future? Um, the adaptive capacity of the system we're talking about, you know, if we design and build it today, is there any option to modify its design in the future? Or is it something like a tunnel where we build it and once it's underground, it's virtually impossible to modify? So if we don't size it large enough to begin with to account for climate change, we have an issue. <laughs> um, and then, and then, yeah, risk tolerance, I guess, in, a, in very broad terms, um, is just a concept that we're talking a lot about when it comes to determining levels of service. I think, you know, at the broadest level with utilities, we generally have a low risk tolerance because we're providing critical services to our communities. But, you know, on a project level, uh, that conversation also needs to happen. And that's where I think all of these other factors come in, like exposure, sensitivity, the criticality of the asset, you know, is it like mission critical to protect this at all costs from flooding or can it be, you know, temporarily flooded? So yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's, it's something that is gonna take a lot more conversation. But I think the main thing we wanted to start with at PWD is to make sure people are aware of the climate projections that are out there and that they're thinking about them and trying to apply them to every project and have this conversation of what level of service, you know, are we striving for? Okay, thanks. This question's for everyone. Um, what efforts are being made to change design standards in order to better accommodate stormwater drainage? So, What's hip? What's new? What's in the now with stormwater drainage? What what can we expect? Where do we go to look for 
um, new design standards and um, new ways of incorporating stormwater drainage uh, into future projects. I see things all over the board. <laughs> um, there's a lot of emphasis on green infrastructure uh, and bio, you know, bio swales. Uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin is really, I look to that, I use them in this example in my classes. Um, in, I know, right, converting their existing stormwater uh, drainage system to one that is behaves more naturally. And on the other side of the spectrum, I keep running into like uh, um, proposals for like massive tunnels, like a ten billion dollar tunnel that goes under all of Houston and is going to solve all the drainage problems that way, um, which is very cutting edge. And you know, from an engineering perspective, uh, wasn't able to be done at that scale. That being said, Chicago has a tunnel, and so does San Antonio. And so it, it's very, um, to me, the, the cutting edge stuff is a wide spectrum of uh, different, uh, different attempts. I would maybe just add to that, Sam, I think you mentioned earlier that we're really focused or have been focused with our stormwater management on conveyance. And I think thinking a lot more about how we can accommodate this water and live with it when, it, when we do see these what are often termed cloudburst type events is really where we're going to need to head. And we've looked a lot to other cities, including New York. Um, it's not too far from us, but also Copenhagen. that has a comprehensive citywide cloudburst management plan all about what kind of systems can we put in place in a denser urban environment to hold some of that water safely during really extreme rainfall events and then give the systems time to convey it once the peaks have passed. So I think we need to think more about the accommodation piece. Um, from CNT's perspective, we do a lot around green infrastructure, especially the green infrastructure plus the great infrastructure. So make sure it's not just this like one or the other, but a combination of the two and how those can work together. And also thinking not just about dealing with the water, but what are the multiple benefits for communities that it can provide and working with communities on that right because then that's going to make that like piece of infrastructure a, a more useful piece of infrastructure more than just the water so it's thinking about more about it holistically and just recently learned about how like there is some like engineering things that are done that like it can like look at the water and then like kind of change its size don't know the whole like details of it but that is a thing that has happened in a, another county of illinois um so you know things that are like able to be flexible to the situation and change like how much water is being moved in to like manage the storm water in one spot and allow for it to move yeah and i guess um i'm not totally involved in in this specific aspect of 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 construction but i do know that in california there is a requirement where for new developments you do have a need to have a certain percentage of you know um pervious surface and i know that that is you know before you get your project approved you do have to have that again i'm not um you know i, I don't know the details but I've, I've heard that that is one of sometimes you know developers see as limitations is they need to have these swells and big open spaces i mean to me i think they look beautiful <laughs> but um but yeah i know california has that i'm sure the, um you know the other um states or cities have that as well it's just one thing that you can do as you are um growing um you know as a city or, or as a region um Sam, you had mentioned, and I wrote, I wrote it down in passing, and now I can only read like half of my note. But it was something about um, you mentioned maybe it was the Dutch and living with water, um, or like cohabitating more with water. Could you explain a little more what you meant by that? Yeah, we've been we're in a deep collab with the Dutch for the last 10, 15 years, and um, they they're really good to look at for flood issues because they're usually a generation ahead of America. And one of the things that they have converted from is a resistance strategy to one that um, accommodates water in different ways, whether that's homes that are floating, whether it's areas that they want to flood. Um, they have a very famous project uh, called Room for the River, 
which was simply widening the river, the Rhine upstream to be able to hold and retain more water and reduce that conveyance downstream. And it required mm-hmm. uh, buyouts, uh, voluntary buyouts, which are much more feasible in a Dutch culture than an American culture in terms of, you know, everyone's like, yeah, we'll move. <laughs> it's an upgrade. And um, there, it's, it's this philosophy that is filtered down in different ways. They have these plazas now that are play structures by day in urban environments, but they're also meant to hold water during storms. So they're thinking really integratively around their urban landscape um, to avoid one of the, like the example I showed about sound walls. It's, it's the opposite. If they you know would put in a structure like that, it's to actually reduce the impacts of flooding, not, you know, they're very careful to look at those unintended impacts, but also bake into their urban landscape features that are, um, they call them multifunctional, dual purpose. Um, and, you know, that's, that comes from this changing philosophy of the water's here, climate change is real, we've set the table for risk and vulnerability, um, we can't hold the water back anymore. So how do we live with it? Knowing it's, you know, amongst us and it's part of our living system. Yeah. But I can send you documents too. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna add that it, it's interesting what you're saying, Sam, that, um, you know, there's this discussion in, at my agency that when you talk about flooding, right, it's always seen as a nuisance, right? But flooding in reality, I mean, you think about the dynamic nature of, of a river, of a creek, right? It expands, it contracts. And in our attempt in the past to control things, as you were talking about, right? It's conveyance, moving it as fast as, fast as you can. Uh, but we need to have that change, you know, philosophy, culture, right? Where, yeah, no, I mean, these things change and move around and, and if you're building things in the middle of it, it's going to try to find its own way, right? So um, it's just, you know, learn to live with it, right? And, and design, I mean, for planners, I feel, spe- I think specifically, design cities and regions and, and think about it in a way that you uh, accommodate for that, right? Um, and you educate also, you know, the public, the residents, that it's something that just naturally is going to expand and contract. You cannot fully control it, especially in this day and age. So, yeah. Okay, it's 2.30. We have to wrap up. Uh, this is a really great conversation. There's still a lot of questions in here. Um, I know this is a very touchy subject, and it's a very important subject for all communities. You cannot escape this topic. Um, so uh, thanks to all of you for coming on and sharing your perspective today. And of course, for uh, the Hazard Mitigation Disaster Recovery Division of APA for hosting today's session. Um, so thanks to all of you again. As a reminder, we are recording this, and we'll post it up onto our YouTube channel. It'll be up sometime on Monday. Uh, don't forget to log your CM credits and, of course, visit our website, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast to register for all of our upcoming sessions. Uh, everyone, thanks again for joining us. Thanks to all of our attendees and uh, have a great weekend. We'll talk next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.